my name is Quinn Wheelahan, and my project is Falconry and Native American Culture. First, I would like to thank my mentors, Jody Gross and Brian Bradley, who volunteered Woo! many hours. this project and without this project would not have been possible so thank you <laughs> and why I chose this project I've always been interested in birds of prey I have drawn them ever since I was a kid and we have a pair of red-tailed hawks living in our backyard and I've always been very interested in them and very fascinated by them and the same with the Native Americans I've always been interested in Native Americans and I think I just wanted to learn more about them and I thought building a lodge was a really cool idea. So you might be wondering what these two topics have in common. Well, the Native Americans practiced falconry and were some of the first to practice it. And that's a very, and there's also a very deeper spiritual connection. Um, Native Americans believe that all life was connected to the Great Spirit, especially the animal kingdom. They believed they were messengers from the Great Spirit because they would fly closest to the heavens. And they also believed that the feathers from these birds, the hawks and the eagles, represented courage, power, wisdom, and healing. And so when they would wear them in their headdresses, clothing, weapons, and pretty much everything, and use them in their ceremonies and powwows, it was thought that the bird spirit was with you and that you were carrying the bird spirit with you. The history of falconry, falconry started in China around 2000 BC and then spread throughout the world. It was very popular in Europe and many of the kings and royalty would, would fly and use falconry. And back then falconry was a way of hunting and a way of putting food on the table. But now, it is, now as it has grown into the modern age, it has become more of a traditional sport rather than a way of hunting. What are birds of prey? There are four different main groups of birds of prey. Eagles, hawks, owls, and falcons. What distinguishes them? They are meat eaters and they kill with their talons instead of their beak. They have very good eyesight, up to 10 times better than human beings. They have a hook beak for ripping apart flesh and curved talons for the kill. Some of my falconry experiences I have been hawk trapping. We went up to a mountain in New York and we set up a trap and we caught a sharp shinned hawk, which is the smallest of the hawks. I have also been to Brian Bradley's house, my mentor, to enjoy and sort of get a feel for the daily life of a falconer. I helped him feed the birds, weigh the birds, clean out the cages. <laughs> I helped him and also, of course, fly the birds. I have also been to many of Brian's shows, which I assisted him in those, and one was the fall fair here at the school. And last but not least, I went hawk hunting with Brian. This was probably my favorite, and we took Brian's goshawk that he had recently caught, and we went out and hoping to catch a rabbit. And midway through, we ended up catching a woodcock, which is a very fast and maneuverable, and maneuverable bird. And me and my mom were 10 feet away and we saw it perfect. It was like a scene out of National Geographic. It was really cool. <laughs> and as we were walking back, Brian said that that was probably some of the highest forms of falconry you, you, you will ever see because the goshawks are very hard to train and woodcocks are very hard to catch. So now I will fly a Harris hawk and show you how to fly that. His name is Prince. So. Watch a fly away. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
straight young saplings and that have minimal branches as possible. The exact measurement was approximately 21 feet long and about two and a half to three inches on the width at the bottom. So once we found one we liked, we would say a prayer for it, asking for its life, asking the great spirit, and then we would thank it. And then we cut it down with a handsaw. And once that was cut down, we cut off all the access branches and cut it to its exact size. Once that was done, we carried it down and we put it on the two saw horses and used a draw knife to shave off all the branches. A draw knife is a knife in the middle, has two handles on either side, and you shave off all the bark like that. Once we had all the bark shaved off, we used an ax to cut off all the knots and use a two-handed rasp to rasp them. And once all that was done, we and once we had three big ones, we tied them together and put them up, and that was the drying rack. And the purpose of the drying rack is so they dry so they will not rot. And once, I, this was probably the hardest part of my pro present project, or at least one of them, because it took me many hours after school and on the weekends. Once I had all 16 done, we took it all down and started setting it up. First we took three of the bigger ones, tied them together, and that was a tripod. This was definitely the hardest part of setting up the teepee because it is very hard because you have to tie it not too loose but not too tight. It has to be perfect. So when you set it up, the poles will slide into place and then lock. This part was very hard. It took us many tries. Uh, but once we had that up, the rest is relatively easy. First, um, after that, we add all the remaining poles on. And once that's done, we take the biggest pole, which is the lifting pole, and we tie the canvas onto that, then we lift that up, and then we take the remaining rope from the tripod, and we tie that around all the poles to get those secure, and then two people on either side of the canvas, 
um, one on each end, wrap the canvas around and meet in the middle here as you can see. And then we use these things which are called lacing pins to sort of button it up. And then we added the door with a lacing pin there. And the last thing we did was add these smoke flat pulls and we slipped them in the little pocket there. And the, uh, the purpose of the smoke flaps are so that you can have a fire and you can adjust the smoke flaps depending on which way the wind's blowing. Mm -hmm. And if there is any rain or anything, you can close the smoke flaps all together. So yeah, that is the construction of the teepee. And as you make your way inside to see the other presentations, you can take a look inside. And I have made two other things. I made a prayer stick and a staff, and you guys can all get a chance to see those. And so yeah, is there any questions about the teepee? Yeah. Okay. Are they? Um, they're just young saplings. It's not a particular grant um, or type of tree. It's just whatever pretty much looks good. If it rains, can you still have a fire in the teepee? Um, no, no, you really can't because the smoke flaps. If you leave them open, the rain will just come in. How many weeks does it take you to do it? Um, this, the, like the whole thing could be about a month, maybe a little longer, month and a half, so yeah. Quinn, do you know which American tribes use teepees? Um, yeah, the Plain Indians use teepees. Um, the exact name, the, 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 the Lakota Indians use and is this tribes. The, is this the size that they use? Well, they used, I mean, all different sizes, you know, how many people you wanted more people they'd make the teepee bigger or smaller. This is a five panel teepee. It's five panels. These things are all just panels. So yeah, it's a pretty good size. Okay, so yeah, and please after the presentations, please come take a look at my board and my paper that I've written. And I have a few drawings.